Uh, as you can tell from here, this is our 125th year. Um, and uh, so we're doing some outreach things. You may see re reproductions around uh, at various sites in the city uh, of different works of art. Uh, so uh, come on down and see what we're doing. Okay, and there it shows the, in the top the original building. Well, actually, there was one beforehand, but it wasn't, it wasn't built specifically for the DIA from 1983. Uh, and it's now under I-375, unfortunately. The one that you're accustomed to is from 1927, uh, designed by Paul Philippe Cray. Uh, it has, of course, new additions and a lot of them since uh, we reopened in 2007. So Hidden Stories came from a exhibit of Gerhard Tobork, who was a northern Baroque uh, artist from the Netherlands. Uh, and the curators decided it would be great fun since the Dutch of that time period loved symbolism in their paintings that we might not be aware of uh, looking at it in modern days. Uh, and so they thought we too could do a tour of that, of other things in the museum. And people enjoyed it so much that a couple of us decided to, to do them as talks. So here we go on Hidden Stories. That is um, from the same time period as Tabork. Uh, this is Jakob Isaacson van Rijsdael. <laughs> How do you like that for a name? I always ask kids, I said, how would you like to write that on your school papers every day? <laughs> they say, no. <laughs> this is called the cemetery, or sometimes the Jewish cemetery, and it actually exists about eight kilometers south of Amsterdam. Um, however, Meneer van Rijstaal had a bit of an artist's imagination because you know the Netherlands are below sea level. They took, they, they took the land back from the sea. So there are no rolling hills up there. And the ruins that, that, that are there don't exist. <laughs> so uh, th these right here. Um, so what is this? Well, it is a fancy name called vanitas, which I believe is Latin, and it means the, the passage of life. So he's taking the cemetery here and the, the old decayed trees here and here. That's the end. And then we have trees up here that are in pretty good shape, but they, do, they have a few decayed limbs, some that are in full glory, and some that are just beginning to grow up. Uh, just like in, in life. Uh, there are storms through life, but there's always hope with the sun coming through, and even birds and a rainbow. Uh, and so just like the stream, life flows on. So there's a, a real involvement there with, with lives and, and what he's painted. And up in here, and unfortunately with the lighting, you can't see it too well, but uh, these uh, graves, there are several people in black, and they have white collars. And for a while, the, um, the, the curators and historians thought maybe this was an ecumenical piece, and the ruins were a church, and they certainly look like a church, uh, and, these, uh, and these were nuns. Uh, well, they pretty much decided that's not the case because they've discovered that, that in some, uh, some Jewish families, they come to the cemetery on anniversaries of their, their loved ones, like, like birthdays and things like that, and bring a little stone and place it on the grave as sort of a symbol like, you know, we, were, we think of you, we haven't forgotten you, and we love you. And I think it's a delightful tradition, so that's probably what they're doing. And then we go to another um, uh, Dutch artist, a little bit later, uh, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and this is a female, Raquel Roche. Uh, she, um, uh, her father was a scientist and was particularly interested in, in anatomy and botany. Hmm, do you think he had an influence? <laughs> Uh, so it looks like a fresh bouquet, doesn't it? And if you look carefully around in some of these blossoms, there's actually little drops of dew. Um, maybe this needs to go over this way a little bit. Um, but if you know about flowers, 
you'll know that those flowers don't all bloom at the same time. So what she would have done would go out, be, to go outside, sketch them, and then go, keep going out for each season to re-sketch them and then make a bouquet of it. And she, this was a specialty of hers. She did a lot of these. Uh, there are about 24, 25 different, different blossoms, and there are about 14, 12 to 14 insects. Uh, and you can see a moth, and uh, I believe this is a horned beetle here. Um, and guess what? This is another vanitas. It, over here is uh, a bud, and then it's beginning to open, and then full bloom, and then they're beginning to wilt over here. So again, it's a passage of life. And there's another curious little thing right over in here uh, that's identified as a dung beetle. And I love ancient history and ancient art and ancient myths and that sort of thing. And I thought, a dung beetle? That's what the Egyptians said, move the sun across the sky. And I thought, I wonder if she knew that because Kepera, their name for the dung beetle, which we know as the scarab, uh, they observed mama dung beetle laying her eggs in a ball of dung and then the larva hatch out. And they thought, huh. A circle giving life, like the sun does to us. So they came up with the story that Kepera pushed the sun across the sky from the east to the west. When it sank below the horizon, Newt the sky goddess swallowed it and gave birth to it in the east again. So that's sort of like a cycle of life as well. I had a little third grade boy who, when he, after he heard that story, he looked at me and said, boy, Newt must have had a really big mouth to swallow the sun. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, whether she knew that or not, I don't know, but I think it's kind of a curious thing. Um, she was a successful painter at that time period. That was very unusual. She was a, a court painter for a German prince. She was allowed to join the St. Luke's Guild, Art Guild, also unusual. She lived to be 86 years old, and in her spare time, she had 10 children. Oh. Yeah, overachievers, what can I say? <laughs> All right, there's a close-up of the moth. And then we'll move on to this one. Uh, this is Renaissance, uh, 1400s. Uh, and this is the, the Virgin in the Rose Garden. And um, this is Mary and Jesus here. And in the garden here with the angels holding a crown over her head, symbolizing that she's the queen of heaven. And she's surrounded by female saints. Uh, this one is St. Catherine. She and uh, Jesus is handing her a ring because the tradition says that she dreamt that she was the bride of Christ. So she's quite often shown that way. Uh, and then on Mary's left, our right, this one, that's St. Barbara with that long hair. And she was absolutely stunning, according to legend. And so her father was worried that suitors were going to spirit her away when he was gone. So he built a tower, which is depicted over here, to keep her safe. And while he was gone, she had the masons put three windows in it. And when he came back, he said, why did you choose three windows? You know, I can understand a window wanting to look out. She said, but it's for the Trinity. And at that point, he realized she had converted to Christ from being a pagan to a Christian. So he told her she had to recant that, and she refused. So he handed one of his henchmen um, his sword to decapitate her. And at that precise moment, a bolt of lightning came down and struck him. I thought, ha, got you. <laughs> anyway, she is considered the, the patron saint uh, of lightning. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. But uh, I also wonder if she's the prototype for Rapunzel with the tower and the long hair. Who knows? Then down below in the white, that's St. Cecilia. Um, and she's considered the patron saint of music. The, the reason for that seems to me a little convoluted, but it's still kind of fun. Um, she lived in Rome and was betrothed to another fellow who had also converted to Christianity, and they had obtained a priest to marry them in the catacombs. And after they spoke their vows, some bells magically chimed, and the emperor at the time realized that this was a signal for what had happened. He had his men go out and find them, and they were executed. Uh, and because of the musical bells, apparently, she's considered the patron saint of music. Um, and she's holding right there, 
what is like a, a, a sistrum that the Egyptian priestess used, and it jingles when you shake it. Uh, she also has her name on a, uh, on a, uh, a necklace here. Uh, and this, th this is smallish, so it, you can really do it justice by coming to see it. And the last one over here is St. Ursula. Um, and she has this unbelievable uh, headdress on, which is a symbol for a mast or sail, and I'll, you'll find out why in just a moment. She was the daughter of an impoverished Brittany uh, prince, uh, and she was going to enter a convent. And he discovered someone else, some other prince in France who had a son, and this family was very well off. So he thought, hmm, I'm going to marry her off to him. So when he, dis when he approached her with that, she said, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to enter a convent. So he pleaded and begged. And finally she said, okay, I'm going to get him. I said, okay, I will do it if this young man agrees to go on a pilgrimage with me, uh, thinking he'll never agree to it. Well, it, it come to find out she was taking a group of maidens with her, and the story goes somewhere between 10 and 10,000 maidens. And anyway, he decided he'd go, and I have a feeling it was all those maidens that maybe didn't. Okay, this works for me. <laughs> anyway. Um, in part of their pilgrimage, they were they, a pilgrimage. They were going down the Rhine and and uh, docked at uh, Cologne just at the time the barbarians were attacking. Bad timing. Uh, so down here are some arrows showing, symbolizing that they were all killed by arrows. Uh, uh, this is the mast uh, depiction of the mast representation of the sh from the ship, and her gown is embroidered, which is really stunning, with pomegranates on it. And pomegranates, I have a lot of symbols, and we'll see a different connotation in, a, in another object. Uh, in this case, the seeds are the se seeds of the believers of the faith. So, the, and, and they're sitting in a rose. Uh, the, these are strawberries down here, and this is a hedge of roses. And roses are also a symbol of, the, uh, of Mary. And uh, St. Barbara's holding a lily, which is also a symbol for Mary of purity. Um, so it's a, it's a commercial for Catholicism. Catholicism. It's also a commercial for the city of Bruges. And of course, uh, having lived in Flanders, I prefer to call it Brugge, <laughs> which is a bridge in Flemish. Uh, anyway, uh, it shows the, the tower, the cathedral here, which we know, most people know as Notre Dame, and the Dutch, or the Flemish call it Onze Lieve Frau Cathedral. <laughs> uh, and the tower next to it is the Weaver's Tower, the Lachentouren. Uh, so they were, they were really vying for, for being well known for, for both of those things. Okay, and from there we go to Florence um, in the 1500s. And this beauty is Eleonora of Toledo, Toledo, Spain, Spain. what's she doing in Italy? Um, well, guess what? She married Cosimo. The, uh, the Duke of the Medici. And some of you may have seen our Medici and Michelangelo exhibit about eight years ago, I think it was. Um, and um, she came, she was, her father was uh, one of Philip II's uh, um, uh, helpers, if you will. He was, he was a count, and he came to northern Italy with his family and ruled that area. So she had prestige, power, and wealth, and beauty. Uh, and you can see um, that she loved pearls, so that she got pearls all over and the hair and the ears and down here, and even this tassel is per are pearls. Uh, and the artist's name is Anglo Bronzini. Uh, and he, for years they thought this dress really existed and that she had actually been buried in it, but apparently he, it, was a, it was a figment of his imagination. And when they finally exhumed her, they found she was buried in a simple cotton shift. Uh, but it's a good story. So anyway, there we have those pomegranates again. And in this case, the seeds are symbols of fertility. And she had 11 children, so I guess those pomegranates work. <laughs> Uh, and, this, and this is her second son, Giovanni, who, uh, who was a cardinal when he grew up. Um, she and several of her children died of malaria. Uh, they, that was very common in, in that area of Florence. So uh, 
Uh, he was not, I think he was like 20 when he, uh, when he died. There's an excellent book called The Murder of a Medici Princess, which deals with her sister Isabella, and it's fascinating. They were a brutal bunch, but it was, it's still interesting. Okay, this was sent around, there were several of these made, and they were sent around to courts all over Europe to advertise that Florence was a city to be reckoned with and to bring your trade and your wealth and all that stuff to Florence, because they were, they were, the Medicis were powerful, and they were also patrons of the art, which of course we like. And she was about 26 when this was painted. And there's the husband, Cosimo the first. Uh, he was about 56 when this was sculpted from marble. Uh, he was about 17 when he became uh, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Uh, his, fa his uncle had been assassinated, and the powers said, well, let's get this young guy. We can tell him what to do. Well, they didn't realize what, that he was as strong of individual as he really was. And he started doing all sorts of things, uh, mostly wonderful. Uh, and uh, encourage the arts and encourage trade and merchants to come in and uh, establish a zoo and all sorts of, of things. So uh, they really did do quite a bit of good for Florence. Uh, as I said, it's made of marble. He has illusions of grandeur showing himself off as, as sort of a, a Roman um, emperor with the, the toga and the fibula clasp on his shoulder. And they're, they're in the same gallery. It's a, the Medici Gallery. And there's something that, we, that came through their commissions. Um, it's, a, they call it a grotesque ewer because they had all those grotesques uh, around on, the, uh, on, on the, the decoration. Over here is the Medici coat of arms with the banker's balls over here. Um, and he, he had the Delft artisans come in from the Netherlands and teach his, his artisans how to make these. Well, it, you can see the connection with Delft, but the colors are a little bit different. And the Delft learned theirs from the Turkish potters, who learned theirs from the Chinese, and each one is a little different. Uh, but the clay and the glaze and that sort of thing made, it, made, made that for that difference. And not if, but when you come down to the DIA and come to our Islamic gallery, if you haven't seen that yet, you'll see some of that that follows the Silk Road. It's fascinating. Um, so uh, here's another that they created. This was probably from his son, uh, Francesco. Uh, and this is called a Pietra Dura cabinet, which means hard stone. Uh, and if you can believe it, the, each one of these little drawers uh, are made from uh, semi-precious stones and agate and that sort of thing. Uh, and depicting the animals. And you, uh, when you get up and close and you can see that these really are stones that were carved and fitted to each other into that space, it just, uh, every time I go by and see it, which is probably every day I'm down there, I just absolutely marvel that they can do that. The center figure here is Orpheus. And uh, in Greek mythology, Orpheus played the lyre so sweetly that he charmed all of the animals in the forest. So these are the, considered the animals in the forest. Now, I've taken many a hike in a forest, and I've never run into a camel or an elephant. So I think, <laughs> I, I think they ran into a, <laughs> into a problem. They didn't have enough animals. And plus, maybe they went to the zoo, and they saw them there. Um, and uh, this, the blue here is lapis lazuli, and the, the white is a, probably quartz. Uh, and he doesn't, it doesn't look like a liar to me, it looks more like a, a viola, but I guess that's artistic license. And here's a close-up of him. And if, when, you, when you see it, you can even see where they made his toes, each individual toe. It's really, really amazing. Okay, now we've moved up to the 1700s, uh, and this is Thomas Gainsborough. Uh, this is up on the third floor in our British Portraiture Gallery. Um, Lady Anne, Anne Hamilton, um, and Gainsborough was not the court painter for the royal family, but definitely a favorite of theirs. And the museum has a pretty significant collection of Gainsborough uh, uh, paintings. Um, and um, she was a member of the aristocracy, and you can see that uh, she is wearing ermine. And I get gathered back then, you couldn't wear ermine unless you had royal blood flowing through your veins. There's a, there's a column down in here 
uh, which is sort of a classic pose that, he's, that Gainsborough is bringing back. Uh, and in the background is a country estate. Whether it's theirs or not, I don't know. I, I haven't been able to uncover that. Uh, but certainly they could have afforded it. This is huge. Uh, the, the height is oh, six feet probably. So it, it not only did it display that I can afford ermine, I can afford silks and satins, I can afford to have Gainsborough as my painter, but I also have a house that's big enough to be able to, to, to have one of those hanging there. So uh, it's really an, a, an advertisement. But this lady has a secret. During this time period, a lot of people uh, were suffering from the F after effects of smallpox if they, have, if they survived them at all. And if they did, they quite often had the scarring from the smallpox, including little pock marks on their faces, which of course they wanted to hide. So for some strange reason that I've not been able to uncover, they used lard. And you know, with young people, they say, lard? What's lard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I said, well, it used back in the day, it used to make great pie crust, but I guess it's not good for you anymore, so I don't use it any, any longer. But anyway, that's what they did to fill in those, those pocks, and then to get that British, pale, British, flawless complexion, they put a white cream over their faces. Unfortunately, that white cream had lead in it. And that's not so good. And then to look like they had a tad of health, they put a rouge on it, which had mercury in it. No. Oh, man. What, what were they thinking? Well, many of them were beginning to die at a very early age, so the, the government banned the use of it, but many of them continued to, to use it anyway. Um, and she was about 42 when she died, which is a little bit young uh, for that era, uh, but whether it was from that or not, I don't know. It's not, it's not been anything that I can un have been able to uncover, uncover as yet. Uh, she also has a story with her hair, that big, that big hair. Uh, that doesn't come easily, uh, and they didn't have the stuff that, that apparently hairdressers have now. Obviously, I don't use it, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so in order to give the volume, they would take a fine form of steel wool, rub a little lard on it so it slipped in. Un yeah, they had a thing about lard, I guess. Um, underneath their real hair to give it volume, and then to make it look that soft, kind of grayish almost look, they put a flour, wheat flour, very fine grade of wheat flour on top of it to give it that, that, for, that, that was the fashion. Uh, so um, you can imagine after all that effort, they didn't want to put their heads on the pillow at night. So the hairdressers created a cage for them to wear over their heads. <laughs> A cage, yes, made out of wire, and so the, it served two purposes. It kept their hairdo beautiful and lovely. It also kept the critters away. <laughs> yes, uh, you can imagine they didn't do this every day. So after maybe a week to ten days, the lard and the flour got a little nasty, and it kept the big critters away. But the little critters, not so much. So many of the ladies hanging from their sashes had, a, had an elegantly carved stick. And if, if, the, if the little critters started biting, they would scratch their heads. And when, you know, when I thought, oh boy, that doesn't sound very ladylike. And of course the kids, you know, the girls say, oh, gross. And the little boys say, oh, cool. <laughs> so, so, and there's a cartoon. <laughs> I know, isn't that amazing? Yeah, but uh, spoofing, of course, spoofing at you know the the vanity of people, you know, creating uh, things like that. And apparently, in the Austrian courts, they did the same thing. Even had people behind them with with crutch-like things that held it up because it was so heavy. Nah, I don't think so. Not for me. Okay, a real switch to Vincent Van Gogh, um, and uh, this is the Postmaster Roulin. Um, this was uh, during the time that he was not very happy. He, didn't, he wasn't very happy most of the time, but this was a particularly bad time. He had come to Arles and committed himself to an institution because he knew that things were not going right for him. He had some kind of seizures, 
Uh, he was given some medication for them to try to control them, and apparently they caused a ringing in his ears that were so intense that that's a theory that that's one of the reasons why he took, cut part of his ear off, because he just couldn't stand that ringing anymore. Uh, he also was, like many artists, licking his, his uh, paintbrush uh, to get that fine point, and of course the, 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 the oil paint had um, lead in it. And then a lot of the artists were, were drinking absinthe, which, so he was, he was getting a lot of nasty stuff, and all of that could have had done things that, that really made him behave the way he did. Anyway, the Roland family, he, when he, after, he was, after he'd had enough treatment, they thought he could leave the hospital. A caretaker would walk along with him, and this Roland family apparently befriended him and allowed him to paint their portraits, his wife and, he, and Joseph and their children. Uh, and you know, even though it was an unhappy time, that was a, an endearing story. And you can see the brush strokes in his beard that are so typical of Van Gogh here. Um, and this is in the modern gallery right now. And here is Vinnie himself, uh, his self-portrait, uh, one of about 24 that he did. And again, he painted a lot of self-portraits because he didn't have to pay himself. Um, <laughs> And he, took a, he had a little uh, valise where he kept clothing in it so he could change his appearance somewhat uh, and paint these. But the, but the peasant uh, look was his favorite, at least from what I've read. And one of the reasons is because he thought they had such honest values, and he appreciated that very much. So he, you'll see him, different depictions of him like that. Um, you can see his broad brush strokes. He even used his fingers on the smock on the shoulder. Uh, this was during a happier time, about a year before the previous one, when he was living with his brother Teo in Paris. Uh, so he had a family with him, which was kind of nice. And Teo managed to sell one of his paintings while he was living. And uh, Willem Ballantiner, our, our uh, director, uh, first director at the, Cray, at the current building, uh, purchased this and people criticized him because they still hadn't accepted Van Gogh at that time uh, as, as being a real painter, a real artist. And now that's one of the first things people ask to see when they come in. Uh, so it, this was the first self-portrait of Van Gogh that entered um, a, a US museum. So we're proud of that. They told me I could boast, so I'm boasting. <laughs> Okay, uh, another different, different one, and this is a portrait of a collagist. This is Benny Andrews uh, in about the 1890s, I think he painted this. Uh, and you can't really tell that for you know, from this, but the, some of those pieces are clo cloth and clothing. So these pieces have, are cloth. This is cloth over here, the bird and the vegetation, his collar. Um, part of his, his uh, vest uh, and part of the palette uh, and, um, and then his jeans and you can't see it really well but there's a zipper on the pocket there and apparently these really belong to him and there's a sign right next to it says please don't touch the art and my understanding is that they've had to replace the zipper four times because people can't keep their hands off of it. Oh, I, you know, so security guards go through there quite frequently, <laughs> and it is tempting. But anyway, and uh, on another thing, he, he sh his head looks a little out outsized from his body, and one of the theories is that he studied African art, and in, in many of the African art pieces, you'll see that the head is larger because they think, thought that was the most important part uh, of your body, and I guess they were right, it really is. Um, he was the son of, sh of sharecroppers in Georgia, uh, they had no money, but he knew he wanted to be an artist, so he joined the uh, Air Force in the Korean War and afterwards was able to afford to go to the Chicago Museum of Art, got his degree and went to New York and spent the rest of his life there. But he didn't forget his back background and he helped a lot of struggling youngsters, not only in art but in other, uh, other areas, so I have a great deal of, my, of admiration for him. And every time I go through there I say, hi Benny, how are you? <laughs> Okay, uh, back in history, uh, Egypt, ancient Egypt. Uh, this little figure is, oop, is maybe six or seven inches. Uh, it's made out of faience, which is terracotta, and it's been glazed with blue. Uh, it, the blue doesn't really show up very well. 
anyway, uh, these were taken into the tombs, if you could afford it, and hopefully you could afford 365, because they wanted one for every day of the year. Uh, Shwa Abdi means one who answers. And um, they, they thought that in your afterlife, which was supposed to have been even better than this one, uh, that you could, you could lollygag around and say, OK, I want my dinner, or you know, go, go get my shoes, or something of that sort. And the one who answers would come and, and do your bidding. Uh, Tutankhamun had 800, and he was a very insignificant pharaoh. So you can imagine some of the real big ones, like Ramses II and ones like that, no telling how many they had. Uh, but there's a whole case in the, Egypt, in the Egyptian gallery that has a number of these in them. So I, I, I rather find them charming. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of Schwabtis. <laughs> I tried to get my kids to be Schwabtis, and they're not buying it. Okay, another one that the museum is well known for, and that's Peter Bruchel's wedding dance. Um, this is the Renaissance, 1400 uh, time period. He was actually born in Breda, which is in the Netherlands, but spent most of his time in Antwerp. Uh, and uh, this was during the time that they were the Spanish Netherlands. And um, uh, this Spain really had a lot, a lot of a powerful control over the lives of the people, and they didn't want the Flemish peasants to partake in their festivities, the, the kermises, carnivals, uh, this kind of wedding. And so they had to kind of do it on the sly. And Bruegel, like Van Gogh, appreciated their basic values. So he tried to paint these as often as he could get away with. Uh, so and this is the, one of those depictions. Uh, in the back, uh, where to go here, is a cloth between two trees with some flowers there, and that's where the bride and groom would have said their vows. And that's all over, so now it's all fun and games, uh, dancing and so on. Does anybody think they can spy the bride? She doesn't look like any of the other women. The one in black? Yes, the one in black, good. Okay, right here. And she has her hair down and uncovered, and that's the real, the real signal. Because if you look, all the other women have their heads covered. And the, the difference in styles, I'm, I think, is probably denotes the village from which they come. I don't know that for sure, but that's that makes, what makes sense to me. The man with whom she's dancing is probably her father. Uh, if you look at his face, he doesn't look he doesn't look like a, a younger fellow, uh, but they don't know where the poor groom is. <laughs> it's like the weddings today. Where's the groom? <laughs> um, and uh, when, uh, when uh, the last several years of Bruegel's life, they moved to Brussels. And w when he was dying, he told his wife to destroy all these uh, because he was concerned that his family might get in trouble. Uh, with, with having uh, painted these things, and he didn't want that to happen. Fortunately, she didn't destroy all of them. And when Valentina saw that this was uh, available for purchase, he said, we have to get this. I think this we got, the museum acquired this in the 20s or early, maybe early 30s. And museums all over the world ask to borrow it, and it's so fragile that the museum, as far as I know, has never loaned it out. Uh, it's on panel. It's on an oak panel. And, it's, it's in our uh, medieval and renaissance gallery. Yes? And, and so how do you address the um, anatomical pieces on the men? The cod pieces? Yes. Well, I, yeah, I, you know, it was for, no one has ever told me exactly why. I, you know, I think they're probably flaunting. <laughs> well, I, think red, red I know. And, the, you know, people walk in there and they stop dead in their trace. What's that? <laughs> And, and, and some people, some, some people, you know, are, you know, like, oh, I, I didn't see that, did I? Uh, but, and apparently there was a, a, years and years and years ago, there was a very wealthy donor, and she informed the museum to, to uh, paint over them, and apparently they did paint over them at one point. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, yes, yes. They're, they're out there in all their glory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Equal. <laughs> okay, now we go into Asia. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes. I heard Michael Farrell, who's in our lecture, say that it isn't what you think it is on those men. That's where they kept their coins. That's what he said. Their coins? Their coins. Their money. Yes. Oh, no, I hadn't heard that. 
I don't, I don't know. That sounds a little uncomfortable to me, but. <laughs> Well, and he, he has a lot more training than I do, so, you know, I'm fine, go with it. Um, but, yes, it's always a topic of conversation, and I have a zillion stories about people and what their comments have been. <laughs> so if you have a few hours, stay afterward. <laughs> okay, we're, we're in India, uh, and this is Parvati, uh, and she is the daughter of the gods of the Himalayas. Um, and uh, she, she is right in a case right next to Shiva, who became her husband. But when she first became known, uh, uh, Shiva's first wife had died, and he had gone into a cave and refused to come out, and the country was just falling apart. And no amount of pleading or, uh, would, uh, would inveigle him to come out. So she finally entreated him to come out, and eventually they were married, and, and the, the, the country area flourished, and everything was wonderful, and apparently it was a very charming, delightful relationship between the two of them. She um, is uh, a, a very powerful deity, and her, one of her symbols is the lotus here. Uh, she probably had one in this hand, and she also had a, has a snake going up uh, her arm. Uh, could be for rejuvenation because of the shedding of the skin, that sort of thing, uh, uh, and also power, of course. Um, she would not have been seen this way. She does have clothing, believe it or not. Uh, the, you can see the gauzy pants and a, a belt around here. Uh, but the, the general populace would not have seen her this way. You can see where they had poles that went through here. And for festivals, they would take her out, but she'd be cover in, covered in fresh flowers. Uh, so uh, that now whether they kept that up when she was in in the in the temple or not, I I don't know. But certainly for for uh, that, okay. And if you think if you think if you can't tell, she has an hourglass figure. Wait until you see this one. Oh. Whoa! <laughs> uh, but you can see a little bit more of the clothing here, and and the the the, the more of the lotus blossom here, and the one back here on her on her headpiece. Now, we're going to another deity, and this is, this is actually Venus because it's a Roman copy of a, bronze, uh, of a Greek bronze Aphrodite. Uh, this is up in the balcony overlooking Prentice Court where the Greek, uh, Roman, and Etruscan pieces are. Uh, and they, they, the historians think probably this is from the judgment of Paris. Uh, if, if you've ever read the Iliad, uh, you know that uh, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite were arguing over who is the most lovely. And uh, so, and Paris, the son of the king of Troy, Priam, uh, was supposed to be the judge. Uh, and why Aphrodite felt she had to bribe him, I mean, if I looked like that, I wouldn't have to bribe anybody, but, you know, uh, apparently she felt she did. She told him he could have the most beautiful woman in the world if he chose her. So he chose Helen, which everybody thinks is Helen of Troy. And actually, she was Helen of Sparta. She was married to Menelaus, the king of the Spartans. And of course, the kids all say, they lived in East Lansing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry, Greece. <laughs> so anyway, she was spared. There are various, whether she went willingly or whether she was spirited away by Paris is not known. But uh, she, they have, it was supposed, the, the way, supposedly, that the Trojan War began. So anyway, that is, that's her. Uh, and I, if I didn't say it, it's made of marble. And then uh, another Roman, and this, this one is uh, Nero. And I asked the curator, how do you know it's Nero? Because there's no mark on it. And he said, well, look at his haircut. I call it a Beatles haircut. His pointed little fox chin. Uh, all these are things that are typical, apparently, of, of sculpture of Nero. And he had ears sticking out like this, which I call Prince Charles ears. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> uh, and this is called a Togate statue. Uh, the Roman boys, when they achieved the year 13, uh, were given a toga to wear. So whenever I hear anybody complaining about teenagers, I say, yeah, how would you like to have Nero for a teenager? <laughs> Whew. <laughs> it would have been a trip. Uh, and then this is over in Africa. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, the, Dr. Nick Quarkapone, our curator, has done an absolutely miraculous job with our African collection, so I would encourage you to see that area. Uh, <clears throat> this is not terribly big, maybe 15 inches tall. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a mystery, but they do know some things about it. And it, all of you know this is Michigan, right? Okay, I learned that when I moved to Michigan right away. Well, let, pretend, use your imagination and pretend this is Africa. Okay, Atlantic Ocean is out here, Mediterranean is up here, and this is that bulge that comes out. And Benin is over here, the country of Benin. And I assumed that that was where it was from. But actually it's from Nigeria, from Benin City, uh, which is in the south part. Um, Anyway, uh, they thought they they think he's a Benin warrior, but there's some oddities there. Anyway, let me explain what what you're seeing. Uh, the headdress. Uh, this is pointing to the realm of the celestial uh, area, so he has control over the skies. Uh, he has a replica of coral on his collar, so over the realm of the seas. And down in the back, you can't see it from here, the back, his back and the back of the horse uh, is a simulation of a leopard uh, pelt. So control over the land, which pretty much covers everything. So he was a pretty powerful fellow. Uh, and, um, and also he's riding a horse, and they were not allowed to ride horses unless they were royal. The question is, the Benin warriors rode side saddle. And I've, I've been on a side saddle before, and, I, and there's no way you could, I could get into battle and keep my balance. So I think that's pretty incredible. But nevertheless, that's what's perplexing them, along with the shape of the, sh of the shield, which here is oval, and the Benin uh, shields were round. So who is this? Their theory is this was a Yoruba prince from northern Nigeria that came down and started um, the, uh, the kingdom of Benin. Uh, I don't know that they know that for sure, but that's, a, that's their theory from their clues, which is kind of fun. They should be, it should be in our next exhibit, which I'm going to show you a, a bit of. And our last piece is this lady, and I, I, the color is not true. Uh, it's, it's too yellow, and I've had the technicians look at it, and apparently several other people have the same problem. For some reason, it comes out yellow. It, both of these pieces are bronze, uh, made with the lost wax process. From the, uh, this is about the 1300s, so they already knew that, which was a really complicated process. Anyway, uh, this is the Queen Mother, and uh, she is... Uh, showing us that she is also very wealthy. This is to symbolize coral beads and necklaces. And no, she's not one of those ones that extend their neck. A lot of people think so, uh, but she's not. Uh, that's a different cult culture. Uh, <clears throat> she has scars over her eyes. Uh, the women, apparently, for some reason, had four over each eye. What the reasoning is behind that, I, I've not been able to discern. And I believe the men had three. Uh, the, um, the, this amazing headdress uh, is, is also coral, and it's supposed to simulate, simulate a rooster beak, which was her protective deity. And at first I thought, why wouldn't you have something like a lion or you know, a leopard or something like that? It's powerful. But when you think about it, the rooster wakes you up in the morning, how much more power can you get? Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's what that is. Uh, it's hollow, and in the back there's an opening, which would have been where uh, an elephant tusk would have been inserted, and it would have been carried out for festivals like Parvati in a way. It was also left at an altar as well. She was in constant communication with her son, the king, and he was forever sending messengers asking her advice. Uh, and so she was very powerful, and of course, I don't have any argument with asking your mom's advice. I think that's great. You know, why don't, why, uh, why don't my kids do that all the time? Uh, so anyway, she would, she would send messengers back with, with the advice that she gave him. So she was very much revered. Um, and, um, and I love th these, the shape of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth are very typical of the Benin uh, figures that you see. They, they, they almost, you can see that in almost all of them. And of course, I look at that and think, I wonder how much Joan Rivers has paid to have cosmetic surgery to make herself look like that. <laughs> so anyway, I, just a couple things. Oh, there's a side view of her, her profile. Isn't that amazing profile?